In this lesson, I'm going to provide an introduction to elimination reactions, and specifically, we're going to talk about the stability of alkenes and how that leads to what is known as Zaitsev's rule, which is going to help us predict where an alkene will form. Now, we call these elimination reactions because we're going to eliminate two sigma bonds from adjacent carbon atoms in order to make a pi bond between them, which will then result in an alkene being produced. Now, we'll see in the future you can also form alkynes, but in this chapter, we will restrict ourselves to only looking at alkene formation. And after this, we'll then go through uh, lessons on E2 reactions and E1 reactions, and then compare and contrasting the two. And then we'll see how actually we need to be able to compare and contrast elimination and substitution reactions all at the same time in order to predict the major products given what substrate and what base or nucleophile is provided. Now, if this is your first time joining me, my name is Chad. Welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to make science both understandable and even enjoyable. Now, this is my brand new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications. You'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. All right, so let's have a little fun here. And before we can talk about elimination reactions, we gotta, really got to start this off by talking about the stability of alkenes. And it turns out how substituted an alkene is it totally affects its stability. So uh, the way we're going to look at this here, so it turns out the most substituted alkene, we're going to look at an alkene here, and each of your sp2 hybridized carbons is bonded at two other things for a total of four other things. And if all four of these are bonded to carbon chains, and I'll just make them methyl groups for ease, that's as stable as it can get. And it turns out the molecular orbitals forming these carbon hydrogen bonds are gonna overlap with the pi electrons in the alkene through what we call hyperconjugation, same thing that stabilizes carbocations. So, and that delocalization from that hyperconjugation actually makes the alkene more stable. And so the more of these carbons you're bonded to, so the more of that hyperconjugation you get, the more stable the alkene. So we would call this a tetra substituted alkene. So, and as we work our way up, I'm just going to replace one of these carbon chains with a hydrogen. So, and this here is going to be a tri-substituted alkene. And with the uh, hydrogen here, always got an S orbital involved in the bonding, and there's no chance for this hyperconjugation. So again, it's all these carbon-hydrogen bonds that are actually involved in that hyperconjugation. So with none of those present, no chance for hyperconjugation. And so for a tri-substituted alkene, it's not quite as stable, and it's going to be higher in energy up the chain. So next on our way up the list are going to be di substituted and it turns out there's a couple of arrangements you should definitely be able to compare. And one is trans here. Cool, and the other here is going to be cis. Cool, now these are both di substituted arrangements, but with a different geometry here, so double bonds can't rotate, so these are distinct from each other. So, and the trans experiences less sterics than the cis, where these two methyl groups are closer to each other, and as a result, the trans is more stable, lower energy. Cool, moving on from there, we'll then go to a mono substituted alkene, where three out of the four positions are occupied by hydrogens and just one carbon chain. And then finally, we'll get a completely unsubstituted alkene. This would just simply be ethylene, and it is the highest energy here of our alkenes. So once again, to summarize, so the more substituted the alkene, so the lower the energy and the more stable. Okay, first we're gonna take a look at the anatomy of an elimination reaction here. So in this case, an elimination reaction, they call it elimination because we are going to eliminate two sigma bonds to make one new pi bond. And we'll do it from adjacent atoms here. And uh, just like you saw with SN1 and SN2 reactions, one of the two things we're going to lose here is a leaving group. And it's the same, uh, same leaving groups we saw with those substitution reactions. So halides are pretty common. So, and in this case, the atom losing the leaving group is often labeled again as your alpha carbon. So alpha carbon for where a functional group, in this case, the alkyl halide is located. So, and what we'll do is typically lose a hydrogen from one of the adjacent carbons. And so we've got a couple of options in this case, two different possible beta carbons. And so sometimes because you're gonna lose a hydrogen from a beta carbon, and then the leaving group from the alpha carbon, sometimes they even call this beta elimination. So, but in this case, elimination, we're gonna lose two sigma bonds and make one new pi bond. So in this case, we're definitely always going to lose the leaving group. So, and then maybe we lose one of these two hydrogens to make one of these two products, or maybe we lose one of these three hydrogens to make the, f the product on the far right. And what determines which we form as the major product is what's called Zaitsev's rule. So let's put that up on the board here. So we got Mr. 
Zaitsev, and when this guy emigrated over... So his name got transliterated in English a couple of different ways. You might see it in either way. And so typically we'll talk about Zaitsev's or Zaitsev's rule. And this just helps us figure out when you got a, a multitude of elimination products. So which is major and which is minor. So what Zaitsev ultimately said is that when you've got multiple beta carbons, you always want to prefer the one with the fewest hydrogens. That's what his rule actually said. That's the way he worded it. So in this case, we can see that this beta carbon has only two hydrogens, and this one here has three hydrogens. So he would say, prefer the one on the right here. Now, if we look at what's really behind this, the idea is that it's not that this has the fewest hydrogens, it's that it has the most carbon is often how we'd look at it. It is the more substituted carbon, and being the more substituted of these two beta carbons, it will form a more substituted alkene. And as we just learned, the more substituted alkene is the more stable alkene. So this is really what's governing Zaitsev's rule. So if we look, if we choose this beta carbon on the right, turns out there's two different alkene products we can get, one trans and one cis, and the trans being more stable. So this is going to be our major product. So this would be one of the minor products. So, and then this guy over here we'll learn is also one of the minor products. So to get the, the product on the far right, now we'd actually be deprotonating opposite of what Mr. Zaitsev says. And so Mr. Zaitsev's rule here is not about the only product you form, it's just about the major product you form. So preferentially take from the more substituted carbon uh, deprotonate there. So in this case, if we deprotonate on that less substituted side, we'll get this minor product. So, and get a couple of different names that might be referred to. And one of them is, anti zaitsev or again as you prefer anti zaitsev so but often much more commonly so you'll hear it called hoffman elimination when you form the least substitute alkene now in this case it's just the minor product so we might call this the anti zaitsev product or the hoffman product kind of sorta of. but we'll see in certain e2 uh, elimination reactions we can actually make the hoffman product the preferred product so but most of the time the zaitsev's rule is going to allow us to predict the major alkene product in most elimination reactions now, if you found this lesson helpful, consider giving me a like and a share. A couple of the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you've got questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with these lessons, or if you're looking for practice problems, I've got quizzes and chapter tests and practice final exams, all part of my premium course on chadsprep.com.